Mini episode 1468 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Night two, uh, safe to say. Uh, pretty easy to gloss over uh, major parts of it here, uh, not least of which the opener, uh, you know, Rated RKO and uh, the Street Profits and uh, the Academy and, uh, you know, a, a lot of guys in there, not, not including Randy Orton, but a lot of guys in there that I would have some degree of uh, appreciation for in a vacuum. Uh, in this setting, again, I'll give it two and three quarter stars. I mean, it was a decent enough match, but... Uh, unlike in AEW, where you know they're going to take the tag teams and they're going to let them turn it loose. And again, you might not like, you know, the excesses of all of the stuff with the Bucks. And, and there's some stuff with the Bucks where I don't like the excesses either. But I mean, I, I'd rather have it be something like that. I'd rather have it be something like where you have your best teams and you're letting them turn it loose and really show what they can do. This is the biggest show of the year. Uh, and these guys put together a match that would have been like an acceptable match for Monday Night Raw, you know, much less WrestleMania. Right, and unfortunately for them, um, I had, I had uh, two days earlier had watched FTR versus the Briscoes, so the bar was so Ooh. high that they were not going to come anywhere near. Which, by the way, that was the best match of WrestleMania weekend and the, and the match of the year so far, in my opinion. Wow, is the FTR versus the Briscoes. Did you see that match? You haven't seen it, but I heard it was awesome. Oh, dude, go out of your way to watch that. It was, you know, um, as much as it knocked the Young Bucks, even the, you know, the follow-up sequel to uh, On Dynamite with FTR and the Young Bucks. Yes. That was also a, a fun, like, m- uh, match that was more of an FTR match than a Young Bucks match. I right. guess, you know, that's kind of like my whole issue is like, they... FTR is a throwback to like days gone by of what I enjoy in tag team wrestling, as are the Briscoes. My, my issue with the Bucks is that there's no, none of it matters. They just do stuff. It's like a car. It's, 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 it's literally a stunt show to me. Right. Where it's like, well, do something, 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 over. I, 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 I agree. It counts. There's no selling. There's no nothing. It's just like next thing, next thing, next thing. And then, like, uh, to bring it back to, to Mania, the RKO spots are cool. Other than that, I couldn't tell you any a single thing about this. However, I do got to say, Randy Orton looks like he's having fun getting high with his friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what accounts for it. It's all weed-based. By the way, I, with, with, the, uh, with the Young Bucks being EVPs, okay, I, I think part of their job has been doing agenting for the tag team division. Can you imagine getting a lecture from the Jackson brothers on how you need to interject more psychology in your match? <laughs> right. I, that, that would be... Uh, but you know, to the credit to the Bucks, they kind of realize that, you know, they acknowledge that... What they, they acknowledge what they are. Right. On camera and off of it. They acknowledge what they are. Like, for, for much as, like, you know, it may sound like, you know, I, I despise them, which I don't. You know, there's times they get into it. Uh, like, their matches, you know, they're, they're entertaining for what they are. Right. But... Unfortunately, once you see one, you see them all. Yeah. It's just, let's just keep throwing stuff at the wall until, you know, it, we run out of wall. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's true. That's true. And it's it tells you how much we think of this opening match that we have spent a lot more time talking about FD, uh, FTR and the Young Bucks than we did about the three participants here. Dude, I literally, other than the RKO spot, I don't remember anything about it. Yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, deeply mediocre. And, uh, again, un- unbecoming a WrestleMania match, much less an opener, uh, which also oh, sums oh, up... Oh, hang on, hang on. We forgot one thing, though. We glossed over it. Yeah. I did remember something. Okay. The whole Gable Steveson thing at the end of it. Yes. He came out there. Yes. He's like, eh, he's got some work to do. <laughs> well, and I think we all, ha- we all had the same thought, didn't we, when he came out? Wow, Chad's losing a last name. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Chad Gable, Gable sees it. Oh, pal, it's too confusing for the audience. Your name is Chad. Yeah. We'll call him Shorty G. 
Uh, that or Gable, Gable Stevenson losing a first name. I don't see that happening. Well, you know, he's, he, 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 he's, they're not going to take, take away an Olympic gold medal of state. Yeah, he's the investment. So, uh, you know, you have that uh, happening. And then uh, the next match here, which, uh, you know, t- talk about setting the bar low. Two and a quarter stars, and I was probably feeling generous. Almost on Lashley, and it was a thing where, I mean, I think the outcome was actually a good one because, and this is the problem you get into, is is that you get guys in the business who really have no business being pushed high on the card, but you have no choice because of their physicality. Like, I always said that, like, David Otunga could have been a much bigger star if he'd had, like, 50 pounds less of muscle on him. Because, like, the way that he looked, he had to be pushed near the top of the card, and he couldn't hang. But, like, David Otunga had enough ability and everything like that that, like, if, if, if you could have settled for putting him upper mid-card to mid-card, he could have really thrived. Almost as a guy where, again, at 7-3, and they've pushed him as being unbeatable, and even AJ Styles was no match for him, as great as he is, you, you get into this prison. You, you really back yourself into a corner. Lashley was one of the few guys big enough to eke out a win over him, and then, again, with Great Collie, eventually, the way they got out of it was to make him a comedy face figure to where, you know, if he didn't maybe take it as seriously and that's how he could get beat. And I think over a period of time, they, they kind of made his knees a, a, a storyline liability the same way they probably were in real life lugging that frame around. I mean, with Ole Miss, I mean, there's some things you could do eventually, but as far as this guy looking like a future world champion, uh, not in any way, shape, or form the way that it's going. Ooh, Omos a future world champion. I mean, if that's an idea, that's frightening. Dude, that's, that's what they idea. want. No, 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 Nice Kali was also a world champion once, too, you know. Well, but, hey, it, there's that. Now, as far as this match goes, I was actually intrigued by this matchup for well, kind of like, you know, morbid curiosity when you're, like, approaching a car crash. You just want to see how bad it truly is. Yeah, emphasis on like, morbid. I don't, I don't know if you, if, if you saw my um, my. my, my post on the internet about this match where I said it's going to be the greatest match since the great Kali versus Kane at WrestleMania <laughs> which by the way funny story on that of a sidebar my buddy and I were actually cheering for that match that, as though when we were there as though it was Rich Steamboat versus Randy Savage that's and awesome every move they did we were like oh yeah we, kept, we, we tried so hard to get a this is awesome chant going during that match <laughs> because it was just and of course we like this is awful no this is the greatest thing I've ever seen it's so bad that it's quality entertainment and you know I can't argue with the, the finish you had to beat Omos eventually at some point right and with the bar being as low as it was I was like well at least it was better than the great Kali versus Kane because there wasn't really there wasn't really much else you're not going to get you know um, a five-star masterpiece out of these two, but I don't know what it is about me, but there's just a part of me that, like, I kind of enjoy, you know, the two big hosses going at it and something like that. It wasn't Vader Hansen by any means, um, but for what it was, it was a lot better than it could have been. And quite frankly, probably it should have been. Well, it's just kind of, probably about at three minutes into it, old Moss is just like, um, yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. All, all he has to stand there and go, Argh. and Lashley, it was like, it was basically last. the whole story of the match was Lashley chops down a tree. Well, you know, as far as a Haas fight goes, I mean, something that was a much better version, much like how you talked about uh, FTR, Briscoe's is a much better tag match. Uh, something that I watched right before night one of Mania, I, I tend not to watch Rampage live. I tend to be one of the delayed viewers because, you know, who's got time on a Saturday night for that? But, man, I was looking forward to Powerhouse Hobbs and Keith Lee, and I felt like they sold them short. Like, I, I thought that was going to be like that vaunted, you know, Vader v. Hansen kind of a thing. And instead, I gave it like three and a quarter stars because they should have given that match 15 to 20 minutes. They crammed it in. It was a four-match show with a Dan Lambert comedy segment and a prolonged beatdown after the match. So the match felt like an afterthought. It was still three and a, half, three and a quarter stars in my book, i.e. way better than this match. A vastly underachieving match thanks to the booking of AEW, which is normally top flight, but fell short there. 
was still significantly better than these guys giving their best effort together. That tells you everything. So, you know. Uh, I wouldn't know that if uh, Bobby Lashley gave his best effort. I pretty much think he just worked with what he's been given. I mean. Because Lashley has shown in the past that when he has a capable opponent, he can put on some, you know, you can hover on your, your three, 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 three to have star range with the right guy. Omos is not the right guy. And yeah. Other than, like, him swapping dudes out of the air, I don't really know what else you can do with him. Yeah. Like, I hate to say this, but he really harkens back to the days of, of, of a Jorge Giant Gonzalez to me. Yeah. And, like, there's nothing else you can do. Other than, like, once it's like, you know, um, like, you know, when the Giant comes to town, once you've seen it, you've seen it. You, once you see what he does, that's it. You know, to, to pop a house. Oh, my God, Jerry Lawler's going to be taking on, you know, the seven foot two Giant Monday Night at the Memphis Coliseum. Right. Once you see the match and you see how horrible it is, there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> it, ain't right. like all, it ain't like Omos is going to get up and all of a sudden you're you watching and he's going to whip out a 450 splash. Right. You know? Well, right. I will say that, and again, and I think you and I do somewhat agree to disagree on Lashley is that unlike you, I don't really see him as much like an MMA guy. I just see him as like a gassed up muscle head. Uh, he just has uh, never impressed me greatly as a worker. If he can get carried to three stars or better, then he's in there with like a genius like AJ Styles, who, I, uh, as we'll talk about later on, he, he showed that even he has his limitations based on circumstances. But, uh, you know, the best thing I think we can say about this match is it had the right outcome, and uh, it might be a blueprint for how you go forward with Omos, but who is, again, again, it's a conundrum of how do you have a guy like this on the roster and not have him presented as a top five guy, which in kayfabe he has to be because he's so gargantuan. That's where, again, having these kind of guys on the roster can be a big problem. Uh, having a guy like Sami Zayn on the roster, having said that, uh, is always a great thing because he is so versatile, he can do so many things, I give three and a quarter stars to the next one, him in Knoxville. Uh, look, I am one of the original jackass marks from back in the day and everything. So, I mean, I popped for all the little things here. Also, too, as was noted, uh, the son of uh, Mark Henry uh, and May Young. Boy, has he grown up to be big. Uh, he, he made a big impact there, uh, slapping uh, Sami Zayn across the face. Uh, but, I mean, all of the ones were in here, all of the best ones. And I know Cornette was ragging on it at the end that the mouse trap thing didn't quite work and Knoxville had to give him like a schoolboy. But, uh, again, you're just, you know, you're just nitpicking if, if you didn't. I, I understand, like, if there's people that don't like, you know, the type stuff, you know, all the different things that were in it, whatever. But to me, it's a thing of like, and this is why I defended the whole Halloween match on Dynamite, the, you know, the Ghostbusters and everything like that. There's a place for this kind of stuff when it's done well. And, and in something like this and the whole, you know, the, the Wee Man body slam, I mean, it just, again, if you're going to do it, go all the way with it, do it right. And it might sound weird to, to hear a guy like me, who's yay pro wrestling, boo sports entertainment, putting over this match. But like I said, I am a huge jackass mark. And, uh, again, in, in this rare instance, I will not only give them a pass for it, uh, but say that I think it went as well as it could have under the circumstances. So here's an interesting thing on this. Uh, this is like a very like polarizing match, I guess you could say. Sure. For, uh, uh, to borrow a phrase, for the kind of people who are into this sort of thing, this is the kind of thing they would be, they, they, those people would be into. Thank you, Corny. You're, you're welcome. I thought it was stupid. <laughs> I thought it was stupid, and I was waiting for it to end. Okay. I was just like, oh, this is so dumb. So you never like, enjoyed we're just, Jackass. We're just, no, I mean, I like Jackass just fine, but also, you know, that was 20-some years ago, <laughs> it was just, which is really the game with things that went off this. Yes. I mean, it was fine for what, for, for what it was. I just, I mean, I didn't hate it. I just thought it was dumb. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, okay. I wasn't like, you know, this is a curse on the state of pro wrestling or anything. I was like, wow, this is pretty much watching Sami Zayn do, I gotta get to, as uh, props I give to Owens, I gotta give props to Zane, you know, it was pretty much a one-man stunt show out there for what he was doing, it just, it wasn't my ball of wax, personally, it just, I mean, I don't, I, it's like, and the more over the top they, they went with it for me, the dumber I thought it was, <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, alright, I mean, it, it is what it is. I, I actually said while we were watching it, uh, Kelly and I were both like, because she thought it was stupid too. And I go, we're not the audience they're targeting with this. And that's fine. 
You know, it is what it is. And I, I see, I see them when I'm on social media, and a whole bunch of people are like, "That's the greatest thing I've ever seen. That was so awesome. I need more Johnny Knoxville." And I'm like, "Okay, cool." I'm like, I wasn't offended or anything by it. I just, you know, I'm just like, it was to the level of, you know, how when you thought it was as dumb as it could get, they went even dumber, and they got even dumber. And it's like you had to, like, you know, we talked about, you know, suspending this disbelief with Steve Austin from the night before. It's like. Where was the giant hand hide? I'm like, I'm not even going to try on this. I'm not even going to waste the time to even try to put any logic into what this is. This was a basically a plug for it, – it was it was an episode of Jackass described – or uh, not described. An episode of Jackass disguised as a wrestling match. And for that, for the audience that it was aiming for, they hit the ball out of the park. And I'm cool with that, you know? Yeah. For certain stuff like, for example – I like Bobby Lashley versus Omos. Not a lot of people are going to like that. And they followed up with this, you know? That's why they all say wrestling's like the circus. Some people like the lions. Some people like the trapeze artists. Some people like seeing uh, um, Mark Henry and Mae Young's child make a successful WrestleMania debut. Yes. That part, by the way, was my favorite thing of the whole match. That was great. And immediately pointing out, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> look at that. It's, it's Mae Young's hand. <laughs> That was absolutely amazing, and I will say, in terms of this, the only thing that could have offended me, is there, an, is there a way this could have offended me? Yes, and I'll tell you what that would have been. If they would have had a Paul Bearer hologram handing an urn to Johnny Knoxville, whereupon he throws the ashes of Ryan Dunn in the face of Sami Zayn, yes, that would have offended me. So, you know, they could have... <laughs> This is a sentence I never thought I would hear. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think I almost made you speechless there for a second. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, and, 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 and the, the uh, sentences I never thought I would hear uttered, that was definitely one <laughs> <laughs> Well, I try, Jake, I try. Uh, but uh, there, there won't be any uh, great eloquent sentences I come up with for this next one, which I'm praying we can gloss over. Uh, the piss match of night two. Uh, the women's uh, title match, Sasha, Naomi, Rhea, and Liv, Shayna, Natalia, uh, Zelina, and Carmella. Uh, you know, the, 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 the red-blooded American male in me did give props to the outfits of uh, Rhea and Liv. Thumbs up there, or, you know. Best part of the match. <laughs> yes, yes, best part by far. And, uh, again, always nice to see some gold on Sasha. I'm a big Sasha mark. Uh, it's a good tag team with, uh, with Naomi there. Uh Naomi is somebody who's very athletic, but I, I feel like, you know, the the whole is, you know, less than the sum of the parts. She's an athletic person that I don't necessarily consider her to be a great worker like some of the other ones potentially in there. Uh, and there you know, by, by some of the other ones, I guess I'm limiting it to Sasha and Rhea because I don't think this match was teaming with great workers. Uh, Zelina is, is, is probably above average as a worker, but... Uh, you know, the match basically seemed to be a backdrop for getting, you know, weird and disturbed facial reactions from Corey Graves, which, you know, whatever. The less said about that, the better. Uh, Sasha and Naomi, the right ones go over. I'm happy with that, but two and a quarter stars and begrudgingly at that. Um, the other thing I have to say, that was a match and it happened. And um, remember several years ago when people were clamoring for them to create a women's tag team championship? Right. Be careful what you wish for because, I mean, uh, they're just they're just useless throwaway props. <laughs> well, they are. They are, but it's a thing where, uh, again, it would work better if they had one unified women's title because that would that give focus. You could have some that are going for the tag title, some that are going for the individual title. I mean, I think you'd agree under that way it would probably work a little better, right? Maybe a little more focus? 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. But, but, you know, Vince McMahon doesn't know how to book tag teams. No, he doesn't. Uh, they, these were throw together teams, and part of the reason the match was <coughs> was what it was. Excuse me. Uh, Edge and Styles coming up next. Three and a quarter stars. I found it disappointing. I know you did as well. I'll let you kind of take it away on that because I know you have some very specific thoughts. Um, as I said before, we came on the air. I thought this was the um, this was the uh, most disappointing professional wrestling dream match since Mister Perfect versus Shawn Michaels. Yes. The hype was there so much for people wanting for this to be. And part of the issue, I really think it is, is a stupid character change to the House of Black Light for Edge. If he would have just been himself, it would continue to be, you know, the legend, grizzled, rated R superstar.
star, you would have had half the crowd chanting, let's go AJ, let's go Edge. And the crowd, I really believe, would have been into it. It would have been into the match. It would yes. have been into the guys. And it would have made it you know, even more special. Hell, you could even turn Damian Priest heel at the end of it and have Edge turn heel and win the match. And like, he'd be like, oh my God, he really is the ultimate opportunist. You know, it would have played right into it. Instead, we got this really dumb rip-off gimmick of Malachi Black slash The Undertaker. Even the entrance, I'm like, they just like, took Alistair Black's character and then just regave it to Edge. And it's like, dude, you came back from neck surgery. You know, you were retired for 11 years. No one wants this. Maybe you do, but no person watching it. And unfortunately, it came across as it, it killed the crowd. And they were just like, I don't think for what it could have been if we had, like, you know, the legacy personas that everyone knows it as, as to what they turned it into, it, 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 it was just, I, I'm flabbergasted, really, because to me, it's just like, it, it became what would have been, you know, the build up, you know, you get the whole thing where, like, you know, you get Edge from, from 2006 to whatever his one on top, and AJ, you know, with other places, and they always wanted to face each other. Instead, it got turned into a stupid, typical WWE sports entertainment story that didn't need to be there. The story itself told itself. These two guys that were, you know, at the top of their game always kept apart from each other, and now they're finally going to meet. And instead, we got this whole dumb back thing, and now we've got this god awful uh, character and faction that is a literal ripoff from the other show, like from the other right. promotion. Do you, do, you, do you agree with me on that? Like, it's just it feels like House of Black Light to me. I. House of Blacklight. I see what you did there, but uh, you like that? yes, yes, that's <laughs> excellent. Uh, and two things I will say about this: one is that uh, as far as that goes with Edge, there's a commonality with, with with somebody we talked about earlier on, and that's Ric Flair. In the sense of when Ric Flair was a heel in WCW ninety nine to oh one, he wasn't a heel the whole time, but most of the time, and then early two thousands with Evolution. And I know evolution served a purpose, but basically it's Ric Flair as Triple H's lackey and whatever. In both cases, it is not a coincidence. Business was down in both promotions because it's demoralizing. There's just certain wrestlers that like people, it's like, I got to boo this guy. I got to see him as a cowardly bad guy. I got like, it's demoralizing. There are just certain wrestlers and it's a compliment, actually, that they've gotten to such a legendary status. Look, look, look at the Ric Flair of, like, I never really watched Ric Flair in TNA, but I've seen clips. And it's just, it's pathetic watching him there. And it's just, and they're like, oh, how could Ric Flair be this despicable? It's sad. Because it's like, nobody wants to boo this guy. I mean, he might not want to be a face, but that's the only way that people are going to respond to him. And Edge is at the same point. Edge can't be a heel anymore after everything that he's been through. He just can't, and it's not going to work. And the other thing is, and this is going to be a lot more controversial than what I say about AJ Styles, because it's a thing where I'm going to stipulate first and foremost, it's not fair to compare because where he's at, they're like allergic to having you have five-star matches. You know, They don't like you to go above four or four and a quarter, it seems like, unless it's a real special occasion. So AJ Styles has handcuffs on him that the other guys don't. But when I hear Ric Flair saying on the, on the one podcast about, you know, Brian Danielson is still not at the level of AJ Styles, are you kidding me? With And I realize, again, you know, Dragon's my favorite wrestler at this point. I'm biased. But I've always loved AJ Styles, too. But it's like, you look at them right now, and what has AJ Styles done for his legacy in the last couple of years versus what Dragon's done? So it's a thing of, like... AJ has been in some other matches over a period of time. Really, I mean, if you think about it, his best match at Mania might have been carrying uh, Shane McMahon to that uh, unexpectedly great match in Orlando a couple of years ago. I mean, AJ Styles isn't exactly teeming with great WrestleMania uh, memories, which is befuddling to me. And again, I'll blame it on the booking and the agenting and everything else, because AJ Styles is one of the very best, and one of the very best ever, probably. But for Ric Flair to act like uh, Brian Danielson isn't on his level, if anything, it might be the other way around at this point. Okay, well, let's just go circle back on the, the Ric Flair comment. Let's just uh, agree on this one that, you know, um, Ric Flair's to the point now where he is the adolescent child that just says stupid crap to get attention. 
you know, he's, he's reached a point where he's just, you know, he, he he's acting up in class, so, you know, the, you know, the, the teacher will pay attention to him. It did seem like that's, trolling it, it, when he said that. Yeah, it's like, it's just like, dude, come on, you know full well that that is not the case. Uh, Brian Danielson, the, his matches with the, heck, the run he's on right now is, the, you know, the best, arguably the best run of his entire career. He's yet to have a bad match in AEW. Even his throwaway matches, he makes entertaining. He's right. Great, you know, you know, you know he's going to win, but at least, you know, he makes them they're entertaining and they're, they're fun to watch and all of his matches make sense. I didn't realize that until you uh, bringing it back to Edge and AJ. Man, when you, look, when you look at the list of the opponents that AJ Styles has had at WrestleMania, AJ Styles versus Edge, AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura, AJ Styles versus Shane McMahon. Like, you never would have thought that, you know, the best one out of those three would have been him versus Shane McMahon. Right. But then again, that word McMahon is in there, so it shouldn't be real surprising based on, you know, past track record of how the WWE likes to book things. Mind you, this is the same Shane McMahon who was supposed to be who was booked as a world beater in the men's Royal Rumble this past year. Right. So, like, their vision of what they think he is as opposed to what he actually is are two different things. And you know full well, like, if they, they weren't going to let you know, uh, AJ and Nakamura get to the level they did at Wrestle Kingdom. And I don't really think about this, but you maybe you guys hit the nail on the head as far as the AJ versus Edge. It's like, no, we don't want you to be as good as you can be, which makes zero sense. The right. last time I could, the last really, really good blow away AJ Styles matches at WWE that I could think of were the ones with him and Cena. Right. Yeah, and it's like, why would you have AJ Styles if you didn't want him to be one of the best wrestlers in the world? And that's the thing, and that's where, like I said, I'm not putting this on him. I'm putting this 100% on agenting and, uh, you know, the booking and everything like that. And he is not being put in position to succeed. The agents that set up this match, are, I think, are the ones to blame for it being as heatless as it was and just as blah, and it was like, again, I was watching the match, and I was just underwhelmed, and it was just like, I should not be underwhelmed with these two in there, and it's just, it's befuddling, it's stupefying. By the way, too, further proof that Ric Flair is trolling on half of these takes is when in every other breath he's putting over Randy Orton as one of the three best workers in the world today and one of the greatest of all time. So, you know, just, again, trolling, 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 I guess, as far as the takes go. Uh, as far as uh, this next match, this is another one I'm praying we can gloss over because it was a nothing match here. Uh, Sheamus and his crew here, so uh, Butch was uh, seconding them. Still can't believe he's Butch. Uh, uh, Holland, who's was his tag team partner against uh, New Day. And, of course, uh, let's not let New Day go over to avenge Big E. Let's just have another dispiriting loss for them, for a couple guys who've already been buried uh, back into the mid-card. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I gave it two and a quarter stars. And I, I, some of the matches I gave two and a quarter stars to, I must have been feeling more generous than usual because I just have a lot of contempt for this match. The only thing I have to say about this match is sometimes getting your match canceled is better. Would have been better. Would have been better. And, you know, and the best worker by far out of the five of them is the one that's standing at ringside. So there you go. And the one standing with a stupid name and his thumb up his ass. So, great job yet again, WWE. Way to go on that one. Uh, the next match, uh, you know, you talk about something that uh, overperformed. Uh, I, I feel like it uh, really kind of did. Uh, the uh, don't call him Austin theory against uh, Pat McAfee. I'll give it uh, three and a quarter stars uh, based on the spectacle. Uh, McAfee uh, had his working boots on as he did for the Adam Cole match in NXT. And, uh, again, thought it was a, a good match. Uh, a little surprised at the outcome. I mean, I guess in a way it's, I mean, they could have gotten from, you know, uh, to, to the McMahon-Austin thing another way, much less the give it a quarter star follow-up here of McMahon v. Theory, uh, or McMahon v. McAfee, which, uh, again, for everybody that said Dave Meltzer was a liar when he said that match was on the uh, agenda, it was. They found a way to get to it by gum. And, uh, again, these things taken together as a whole, it's set up the Steve Austin, uh, you know, stunner afterwards, the, the obligatory spot. I did now remember the, the other point, the third point I wanted to make from Austin Owens, uh, and that being that what made it even worse with his stomps and everything like that is that it's no good idiot Kevin Dunn on production 
the million different cuts, the epileptic causing cuts that they do with the cameras. That just made Austin look even worse at the time. Thankfully, they didn't do that the entire match. But uh, he comes out there at the end. McMahon gives the worst ever selling of a stunner of all time. And that says something, that he, he took a worse one than Linda McMahon did back in the day. But, uh, you know, again, you know, McAfee, he was a pro. Uh, he's down there. He's, he's doing the thing. He's drinking the beer on his back at, uh, at, at ringside. I mean, McAfee really came through and, and was the one thing that held this whole segment uh, with the match, the pseudo match, and the Austin beatdown held it together, I felt like. Yeah, um, I'm here all day for anyone uh for all the Pat McAfee they want to give us. Anytime I see him on a show, it feels special. And from his match with Adam Cole to this, you know, obviously he's been, he worked, he's been fortunate to work with uh, top-notch, world-class caliber performers in the aforementioned Cole and with uh, uh, Don't Call Me Austin Theory. Um, my thing that I, I thought, which was a, a kick, was in the second part of the, the whole McMahon v. McAfee thing. Did you like uh, Vince McMahon's impersonation of Orange Cassidy? Yes. I thought that was pretty uh, pretty classic. I was, I was waiting for him to put his hands in his pocket. <laughs> no, I would have popped for that. I would have popped hard if he would have done that. Yeah. Have been like, wait, out of all of the people, that said, all of the wrestlers outside of his bubble, that he would know who he is. I thought that would have been pretty hilarious. But, like, you know, again, this goes back to the night before. This is all about nostalgia. It was, you, you know, I um, mean, Austin Theory's uh, sell job of the Stone Cold Stunner was absolutely epic. I got to put that one up there with uh, the Rock and Scott Hall. McAfee's sell job was also equally as great it's, uh, uh, for, for selling uh, the stutter. This is going straight up and completely sold in a different way. Vince, you know, Vince as well. You know, uh, I know we brag on Kevin Dunn, and rightfully so. He is a troll. But the, the way that they did, they had to edit and splice together to make that thing look at least presentable on the video highlight packages. Someone deserves an Emmy for that outstanding editing performance because I didn't think that was possible. But they did the best they could to make it look like, you know, it was something. It's like, this live, it was just two old guys falling down. Yeah, well, <laughs> and you know the crowd was happy. They, they they got what I guess they wanted to see. I don't know. Vince is a seventy six year old man. I mean, it's like okay, cool. I'm watching a fifty seven year old man pretend to beat up a seventy six year old man. At this point, it's like, can, can, can we be done with this now? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. I don't think anyone was clamoring for Vince McMahon's return to the ring. Um, that I felt was completely unnecessary. They didn't have to have the whole match gimmick of it they could have just done the whole they're gonna fight and then all of a sudden it's two on one and then here comes team austin like you like you said i think there's other ways they could have gone about to get to that point um i the whole vince part of it like he, uh, him walking around the ring i'm like okay much akin to the, the Sami Zayn earlier i'm like i was just like this is stupid <laughs> and i'm like vince and i'm like pat maxie's about to job to this guy he's gonna put him over because, of course, he is, because, you know, it's the owner of the company. I thought that part was stupid, and then at the end of it, here comes Steve Austin, and, okay, that's what the crowd wanted to see. But it came, it didn't get there, but it came very close, because they just did almost the exact same thing the night before. It came dangerously close to overstaying its welcome, in my opinion. Yeah, a couple things there. Uh, one is, uh, again, as, as you said, the ages of the men involved, 57 and 76, uh, you know, they're lucky they didn't get sued for trademark infringement by the Grumpy Old Men movie franchise. But, uh, you know, I mean, as, as far as it went here, the other thing on a more serious note here, as far as, you know, as we said, don't call them Austin Theory. So, Theory, Riddle, Butch, I mean, I, you know, in the case of Pete Dunn, I think we know because they're f complete friggin' idiots and they don't realize that this guy's a top ten wrestler in the world. Uh, and they don't see him as somebody who can draw money, but it's a it's a deal where for anybody you think you can draw money with, which conceivably they do with Theory and Riddle and some of the other ones. I mean, isn't trademarking names supposed to be part of their whole gimmick? How are you going to trademark the words Theory and Riddle and some of these other names here? Much less have them promoted on a poster as a big match. Come see at the WrestleMania main event of Theory versus Riddle, like. I don't understand any of this. I don't. 
I, I just, you know, the whole thing of, like, you drop the first names or whatever of, like, I, it, that's one of the surest signs that Vince is losing it. Because Vince, for the whole thing of, like, some things, like, well, okay, it might be stupid as hell, but at least it makes sense on a marketing level. No, this, this is a big step backwards on a marketing level and a trademarking level, and everything else like that. I don't understand it at all. It's, it's yet another reason that Vince should be thrown in an old folks home and his power taken away from him. Yeah, I don't understand the whole, you mentioned Theory versus Riddle. And like, you see that the WrestleMania main event? Yeah. Two names? It's like, no, I see that as like a college exam. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm taking a college class. Uh, theory versus Riddle 101. <laughs> yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Well, not only like, that, yeah. I mean, you know, picture it. Picture they call somebody up from NXT, change his name to Conundrum, and throw him into WrestleMania for a three-way main event. I could see that. Oh, man, I cannot wait for that to happen. No, never going <laughs> to get it. No. I've uh, spoken it into existence. Congratulations. <laughs> you just, you, congratulations. You just renamed uh, Prime Breaker. <laughs> conundrum for... He's not even Conundrum Breaker, he's just Conundrum. I love it. Just Conundrum, yeah. We found a stupider name than Braun Breaker, it's Conundrum. <laughs> conundrum, here we go. Oh my god. Yeah, it just, so, again, you know, the future is doomed when you look at that kind of stuff here, which, that feeds into the main event, because they've killed off everybody else, so, uh, whoever won this main event, and we all knew who it was going to be, was going to have nobody left after WrestleMania for them to do anything with, but that's... Another story for another day if we're reviewing this card. Uh, what they called the biggest match of all time, uh, Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns. Uh, it is hilarious now that you hear Meltzer reporting on, like, uh, well, Rock, Ray, Roman Reigns has two titles. Well, they don't know what they're going to do going forward. It's hilarious. Uh, so, so Vince of them not to have any idea what they're going to do now that uh, two titles are on one guy. But they did unify them in this match, and uh, it was a thing where, Again, I guess, you know, trying to work the sheets and whatever, but, you know, to what uh, benefit. Uh, I, again, you know, with that ending that they had, I gave the match three and a half stars. Again, largely on atmosphere, because people were geeked for it. The people in attendance were buying it as a big match. The whole thing of, like, Roman yelling into the ringside mic, which, by the way, that's been a thing I've noticed. And I'm a guy that... I only sit through really a couple of their cards per year at this point. I keep up with what's happening, but I only really, you know, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Royal Rumble, that's about it. And I've noticed this increasing thing of, like, all these conversations getting picked up. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about John Cena calling spots type stuff, but of where you're meant to hear dialogue in the ring. I don't like that development because WWE is very bad at having their wrestlers do acting. But Roman Reigns yelling out audibly to the mic about how his shoulder was popped out. And then like a second later, he's hitting a spear out of nowhere to win the match. As though, OMG, had to go to the emergency finish uh, and try to work, the, work the, the, the sheets. When in fact, I guess that was the planned ending. But, you know, spear out of nowhere to end it. Uh, I didn't think this was better than the uh, WrestleMania 31 match that, uh, Roman Reign, or that uh, Seth Rollins got added to. I mean, it might have been better than the match in New Orleans in 18. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was like, it was a good match, and they threw a lot of bombs. It was a typical Brock Lesnar, you know, finisher spamming match uh, where it's all high impact. But, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty good. I mean, it was about, you know, what you're going to get out of these two guys. But as far as delivering on the biggest match of all time or even over-delivering, not even close, in my estimation, on over-delivering. Uh, I actually think it was the worst of the three matches they had around <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I thought the, the first match with the run-in with Seth Rollins, that one, you know, that match was actually really good. Even before Rollins came yes. the problem is that, that one suffered from what the 34 match really suffered from was that the crowd just didn't want to see it. Right. At least this time, finally, the crowd was actually into it. Right. The WrestleMania, their, their, their WrestleMania 34 match... I thought it was great. And if the crowd would have actually, like, you know, been receptive to it, but instead, you know, they went to business for themselves and were just like, we don't like any one of these guys, so we're just going to crap all over this. And no matter what they did, it wouldn't have mattered. This was the one where the crowd was finally into it and wanted to see it. And then that finish was just flatter than a pancake. That was horrible. It was just like, okay, and we're done. It's like, 
okay, after all that, and then Roman Reigns becomes the third ever, first ever undisputed champion, and then, you know, it's like, like you like said before, where do we go from here? I mean, I, I, I think the other thing, too, because that the crowd was kind of anticipating something, you know, there's a whole, like, the rumors of, of The Rock and stuff like that, that I think a lot of people like, had their hopes up, especially after he won, and, you know, he... I, WWE kind of just trained this to the uh, the fans to expect these things. When he beat, um, I forget who it was, I forget who he beat, but then uh, when John Cena came out to confront him, and then when he beat, uh, uh, who was that he beat? Cesaro? Was it Cesaro? It might have been Cesaro. And then Cena made his return, and everyone was like, oh my god, they came out to confront him. And then when he beat Cena, out comes Lesnar to confront him in the main event. So I think the, the WWE, just the way they book things, had got like, okay, well, Roman conquered this person. Who's coming out next to confront him? And it never happened. And the crowd was just like, oh, eh. And so it made the whole show kind of end on a flat ending as a result of what should have been like, you know, this hyped up big moment of him unifying the two titles, which quite frankly should have been unified the entire time to begin with because they don't have, a, as we said, said before, they don't have a big enough roster to warrant a brand split and two champions. I do like the idea of, okay, put those belts together. Let's put the tag belts together. You can keep put the women's belts together. You keep the women's tag belts. And you can keep the U.S. and the Intercontinental title separate. You keep them on each separate show, equivalent of like TV titles, I guess. Right. But other than that, merge everything together because you don't have enough as this show has kind of proven on that. Um, they had to throw in a lot of celebrities, a lot of Gaga, and a lot of fluff to make two nights out of a WrestleMania that, quite frankly, if you take the best parts, it would have been a pretty, it would have been a, a decent enough WrestleMania, not anything, you know, would have been, you know, top five all-time great, but it would have been, you know, uh, middle of the road uh, towards the upper, towards the uh, better uh, uh, as opposed to the worse. But when you add everything else into it, it's just, you know, too much stuff. What's an old saying? Like five pounds of crap into like a ten, ten pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Right. <laughs> well, and, you know, just, I, I will say on a historical note here, when we talk about that, that they don't have enough depth, here's what it is. This is an AWA 1987 of where, oh, MG, we just don't have enough talent in the promotion anymore. This is WCW 2000, where you've killed off a whole bunch of people needlessly. And that's basically where we're at at this point. Finn Balor and Ricochet couldn't even make the shows, and they hold the two uh, other titles here, the U.S. And, and Intercontinental title. Uh, so, I mean, they're not to be taken seriously, and they're your secondary title holders here. These are supposed to mean something. So it's a matter of... Again, they've just killed off so much of the rest of the promotion. And in going forward here, you talk about you know unwarranted optimism, Jake. I go back a period of time, I think this was two years ago, and we were looking ahead to when WrestleMania was going to be in Tampa. That was last year. And you, you I think you even said, because they were talking about Roman and The Rock, and you were like, oh, don't worry, they'll have the belt off of you know The Rock, because that, or the Roman, because that match doesn't need it. And here we are staring down the barrel of that belt's going to be held hostage, both of them it looks like, for another 12 months on the if come of a match with The Rock, which The Rock's not going to be the guy to beat him for the title. So, I mean, Roman is stale at AF as champion, and, like, what's the best case scenario now? SummerSlam 23 when he drops it? You know, it's just... This, this is just... They're making more money than they ever have because they find ways to, to you know, wheedle money out of the marks left and right here with all these secondary uh, sources. But, I mean, you know, the, the booking is like death of WCW caliber, basically. Yeah, and it's easy to make record profits when you fire half your talent. True. Well, that's it. You know, well, and the other thing is, too, and as I said to you on the show previously, that uh, previously going back through and looking at the 2000s on the show with Kyle Ross that I had dubbed that period of time the Lost Generation. Because outside of the class of 02, you didn't have anybody that really sort of came through you know, that entire stretch. And then early 2010s, out of desperation, they turned to the Indies, and that's where you get two-thirds of the Shield, Danielson, Punk, etc. And what you have the last couple of years, I think you would call the Wasted Generation. You mentioned Finn Balor before and some of these other ones like this. Guys that could have been big stars, 
but they've been wasted. And what are they doing? Because these are the guys that Bruce Pritchard remembers from when he was there, they are rehabilitating the lost generation. We're getting to see like, oh, what if Bobby Lashley had been pushed all the way to the moon, but 15 years later, and Drew McIntyre, who, I mean, Drew has actually improved and everything, but he's still older at this point. And, like, we're getting, like, the lost generation guys rehabilitated at the top of the card. And to bring it full circle, could you and I have imagined that in, in the old uh, Sunday night submission days? That, like, the guys that are going to be, like, the failed pushes of the next couple of years are going to be the guys they have on near, near the top of the card in the, the early 2020s. And you can throw another name in there, Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes, yes. Cody Rhodes from that generation, another name too, you can, MVP. MVP, at least as a manager, but yeah, no, he's right. another one. You know, you can keep going down the list, there's more and more of these names, it seems like. And like the, the, Never really thought about that until right now. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's that's who they are recycling and pushing towards the top there. And, and, and wasting the guys like Finn Balor and Ricochet, uh, Keith Lee previous to this, all the guys that they ran off. So it's like they have a poverty of talent there, but it's like it, it's on a self-induced level that makes the self-destruction of WCW at the end look like child's play. Because you could at least say those guys in WCW, they at least had a hell of a run, like you know, Sting might have been burned out to a nub by the time it was all done, and Ric Flair and everybody else, and nobody could draw a dime by the time that thing was done. But they at least squeezed a lot of juice out of the rind before it got to that point. How much juice did they ever squeeze out of the rind of Finn Balor, Ricochet, Keith Lee, the Undisputed Era guys who never made it to the main roster after dominating NXT a couple of years? It's it's incredible how much they've had their heads up their asses, which is a microcosm of this all. Yeah, it's you know, in no other walk of life, a form of entertainment, whatever you want to call it, other than Star Wars, do, do the people in charge punish the fans for being fans as they do in WWE? Yeah. It's like, oh, you like this? Well, we don't want you to like this. We're going to give this to you, but because you like this, shame on you. You yes. don't like this instead. Exactly. And, you know, we, we come out of this every year always hoping for a better thing the next year. Or, or I, I know you're hoping, I'm hoping that we're going to like Mania 39 better. And it's a thing where, as I said, when, when, they, when they launched NXT 2.0, I mean, you and I both bemoaned that, like, the best part of the entire uh, WWE experience was going away. But as I said to you, at least now it's a coherent vision. At least now... Vince won't fail to push these guys on the main roster because they're not part of his vision. It'll all be unified for better or for worse. So it's a thing where, I mean, Braun Breaker, stupid name, but he's pretty great. For a guy who's green, he is really great. So I, if you look ahead, you know, Braun Breaker, there's a lot of people that are really jocking Carmelo Hayes. I'm not really there yet, but I mean, you know, you, you look ahead and like, at the very least, Vince will get behind those guys in a way that he never did with this whole, as I say, wasted generation of the indie guys. So, you know, at least they'll have opportunities. But if it's the same shite writing and agenting, then uh, what what chance are they going to have? And to bring it full circle on this one, um, I don't know if you caught this on uh, this past uh, week on SmackDown. I didn't see it. I watched the highlights of it. But how sad of a state of affairs is it in WWE that when Walter debuts on the main roster and I could care less? Yes, exactly. Perfect point. Perfect point. I mean, he's now Gunther. Pete Dunne is now Butch. And those guys had, I mean, what, what, what is that at, min at minimum that's probably a top five WWE match in the last decade? What they did at uh, the, the uh, WrestleMania takeover? Uh, you yeah. know, a couple of years back. I mean, absolutely just did the best of pro wrestling, what those guys did there. But again, it's all about sports entertainment, pal. So, you know, it, you got, you got, we, we, we've had the dividing lines here. It's sports entertainment on the one side. And like I said, maybe that's where Cody fits in a little better. Pro wrestling, AEW has grabbed the mantle and said, we are the home of pro wrestling. And that is something that's really endeared themselves to the fan base and I think proven to be true. So, you know, 
we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I know we're due in the near future here. We had teased this out for a state of AEW. Uh, so, I mean, uh, heading uh, as we get to kind of the lead up period here for uh, double or nothing, uh, maybe we'll get a chance to get to that and uh, everything. But it is always, always a pleasure, whether it's great wrestling or sometimes even if it's bad wrestling, sometimes it's more fun with you just because of how fun it is to tool on stuff. But Always, always a pleasure, Jake Digman. Thank you so much, my friend. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure as uh, all mine. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, buddy. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this mini-episode of the FDH Lounge. <laughs>